Can we begin, please, by opening our Bibles to Jeremiah and chapter 31? Jeremiah chapter 31, and I want us to read together just verses 35 and 36. God says here, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me for ever. Now the question is, what conclusions can we draw from what God says here? Well, it seems to me we can say this. First of all, we know, don't we, that God will never, ever cast off the seed of Israel. He cannot because of the promises that he has made to the fathers of old. And therefore, we can conclude that the ordinances of the sun, moon and stars will never cease. That's what it says there in Jeremiah chapter 31. Well, in the light of that, what do we make of these words from the Lord's Mount Olivet prophecy in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29? Jesus said, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And in 2 Peter 3, we've got similar language. Peter says that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now, without going into detail about these particular prophecies, we'll look at them a little bit later on, what we can say is that because of what we've learnt from Jeremiah chapter 31, the passing away of the heaven and the earth, of which Peter speaks, and, and the darkening of the sun, moon and stars, of which Jesus speaks, cannot be literal. In any case, we know, don't we, that the literal heavens and earth are, are not going to pass away because God's purpose is to fill the earth with his glory. Now, this is a, a fundamental conclusion, but it's something that I believe we as a community are in danger of losing sight of. Let me just show you these words that were written a few years ago um, by a prominent brother. He said this, the sophistication of the signs in the sky in this generation has become almost commonplace and what further signs are yet to be seen is past the imagination of a layman to conceive it is known that russia's sputniks now orbiting the earth number nearly 500 and the amount of hardware put into space by the americans must be something of the same order these immense projects leaving out of consideration such awe-inspiring operations as moon and Mars landings, are clearly intended to be of a grim practical use when the childish rivalries of the superpowers reach detonation point. Then, assuredly, there will be many a literal sign in the heavens. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, brothers and sisters, interpretations such as that make me a little bit sad. S sad because they suggest, I believe, that as a community we are in danger of losing our way when it comes to interpretation of Scripture, particularly prophetic Scripture. Because instead of coming up with fanciful interpretations like this, what we need to do is to learn to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture for us. The Bible is its own interpreter if 
we will let it. So this is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to try and get back to first principles and, and have a look at what I think is a, a fascinating subject. And we're going to see that frequently in the Bible, more often than we might expect, the heavens and the earth are used in a symbolic way. Uh, and we shall see that once we understand this, um, it actually unlocks for us a, a number of other scriptures that we might otherwise struggle to explain, such as those two in Matthew 24 and 2 Peter 3. So what we need to do is begin at the beginning. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and have a look at verse 14. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14 where it says that God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And so what we learn here is that in the beginning God made two great lights and they were, verse 16, to rule the day and the night. And we've got established here right at the beginning a principle and it's this, that activities in the heavens govern what takes place upon the earth. And Every one of us, we all know that this is true, just from simple observation. So, for example, the day and the night, cold and heat, the seasons, the climate, the tides, even the behavior of creatures that inhabit the earth. All of these things are governed by what happens in heaven. So... We might say that the heavens bear rule over the earth. Now, what we find is that when we look at the prophetic scriptures, this arrangement of the heavens and the earth, this literal arrangement of the heavens and the earth, is used in a symbolic way to represent kingdoms, and particularly, although not exclusively, in relation to the kingdom of Israel. So the heavens represent the rulership and the earth represent the subjects of that particular kingdom. Let me see if I can just show this to you. Can we turn to the prophecy of Isaiah and chapter 1? Isaiah chapter 1 and see what God says here in verse 2. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2. God says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now, question. Is God here really speaking to the heavens and the earth? And the answer is no, he is not. He is addressing his sinful, disobedient people. Look at verse 4. He says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. In fact, so sinful were they that if you look down at verse 10, you'll see that God actually compares them to Sodom and Gomorrah. He says in verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. And of course God, again, he isn't literally speaking to Sodom and Gomorrah. He can't be because they don't exist anymore. He's talking to his people. He is saying that spiritually his people were just as wicked as the inhabitants of Sodom 
and Gomorrah. But just look at the screen and compare verse 2 with verse 10. And what you can see is that we have here a parallelism. So the heavens of verse 2, hear, O heavens, well, that is compared in verse 10 to the rulers of Sodom. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. And the earth in verse 2, give ear, O earth, corresponds in verse 10 with the people of Gomorrah. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. And so we can see here that Israel's heavens were the rulers and Israel's earth were the people. Uh, and so often we find this in scripture, that the kingdom of Israel is spoken of in this way as consisting of a heavens and an earth. Let's just have a look at a few more examples. Daniel chapter 8. Now this is uh, the uh, account of Daniel's vision of the ram and the he-goat. And the vision speaks prophetically about the time when the power of Rome, which was represented in the vision by the little horn of the goat, the power of Rome was going to magnify itself against the nation of Israel and take away the daily sacrifice, which of course it did ultimately in AD 70. And Daniel says in verse 10, concerning this Roman power, it says that it waxed great even to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And we've said, as we said, this was fulfilled in AD 70 when the Romans came and annihilated the nation of Israel and destroyed the temple, took away the daily sacrifice. And so the casting down of the stars to the ground in verse 10 represents the removal of the ruling powers in the nation of Israel. Well, let's go now to Matthew chapter 24 because it's because of Daniel's use of this symbol with reference to the dreadful events of AD 70. Because of that, it's not surprising that we find that likewise the Lord Jesus Christ in his great Mount Olivet prophecy uses the very same symbolism to describe the destruction of the nation of Israel at the hands of Rome. It's in Matthew 24 and verse 29, this is the verse that we quoted at the beginning, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So the signs in the sun, moon and stars were not literal signs, they represented political upheavals within Israel's ruling class. And the powers of the heavens, the political heavens, were shaken as never before in AD 70 because that event was the event that signified the end of the Commonwealth of Israel. Well, now let's go to 2 Peter 3. Because this destruction of Israel in AD 70 was accomplished by fire. And this is what the Apostle Peter is warning uh, the brethren of here in this chapter, that the, the commonwealth of Israel would be destroyed by fire. And so in 2 Peter 3 and verse 10, Peter says that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So, brothers and sisters, let's, when we read verses like this, let's dismiss from our minds any 
idea that we might have that Peter is talking about nuclear war or of spaceships destroying the universe. Peter here is talking about Israel's destruction in AD 70. And a little plea, if you've not read this book, The Last Days of Judah's Commonwealth by Brother John Thomas, dig it out and give it a read because it will open your eyes. Uh, and just in passing, we shan't turn to this, but you might like to compare what Peter says here with Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 6, which is another AD 70 heavens and earth prophecy. Isaiah 51 verse 6 says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old as doth a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. So that's maybe something for you to follow up in your own time. But when we look at 2 Peter 3, we, we need to note that Peter here in this chapter is comparing two different heavens and earths, if that's such a word. Because in verse 10, uh, sorry, in verse 5, he talks about the heavens that were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And he's talking there about the world in the days of Noah, the antediluvian world. And Peter says that this heavens and earth was destroyed, verse 6, by water, it says that the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So that's the heavens and earth in the days of Noah. And then in verse 7, he speaks about the heavens and the earth which are now, and this is the Jewish world, the Mosaic dispensation. And it was going to be destroyed, says Peter, not by water, but by fire. Now just think about that for a moment. Because if we insist on interpreting this prophecy literally, then we have got a major, major problem. Because we've got to explain how the heavens of old were destroyed by water. How did the water of Noah's flood destroy the heavens? And, and clearly the answer is that in the literal sense it didn't. The heavens are still with us. Therefore the prophecy has to be interpreted symbolically. Now in the New Testament the, the nation of Israel is frequently described as the world and especially so in the writings of the Apostle John. Let's just have a look at three examples. We needn't turn these up, but in John chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And of course, they're referring back there to Deuteronomy chapter 18, the prophet like unto Moses. So we know that that reference to the world clearly related to the nation of Israel. John chapter 16 and verse 20, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. And just one other example from John chapter 18 and verse 20. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world, I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. And in the, each of these examples, and there's more, the world, I believe, refers to the Jewish world. And in the Greek, it's the word cosmos. And if you look that word up in a concordance, a lexicon, you'll find that it means order or arrangement or a, a regular 
disposition, something that's ordered. Now today, of course, we associate the cosmos with the universe. So our English word cosmic comes from this Greek word. So when we stand on earth and look up into the, into the heavens and gaze into space, we're looking at the cosmos. And what we can see is the heavenly bodies all moving together in perfect order and harmony. In fact, so orderly is the heavens and the activity of the planets, so orderly is this heavenly arrangement that we can set our clocks by it. Uh, and, and we can predict hundreds of years in advance exactly where the planets are going to be at any given moment. Now, the New Testament uses this word cosmos of the nation of Israel. And the New Testament is describing the nation of Israel as a cosmos precisely because, in a symbolic sense, it consisted of a heavens and an earth. It was, symbolically speaking, a cosmos. Now, if we're still in 2 Peter 3, we need to understand that there have been different heavens and earths down through time. Um, so Peter here in 2 Peter 3 tells us, as we've seen, that there was a heavens and an earth at the time of Noah. That was destroyed by a flood. Then there was a heavens and earth in his days, the Jewish commonwealth. That was destroyed by fire in AD 70. And then Peter tells us that there's going to be another heavens and earth yet to come. A, a new heaven and a new earth. And he tells us about this. In verse 13, he says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And of course we know that this is talking about the, the administration of the kingdom, the millennium. And we, brethren and sisters, have been called to be, to be part of this new heavens. Uh, as Paul said in the letter to the Ephesians, we have been raised up together and made to sit in heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Now, verse 13 here, let's allow Scripture to interpret Scripture for us, because Peter here is making another Old Testament quotation. We shan't turn to it, but he's, he's referring back to the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 65 and verse 17, which says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. In fact, let's just go to Isaiah chapter 65 and just have a look at this verse in its context. Because what follows... So it's Isaiah 65 and verse 17. I behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. This is the verse that Peter quotes. And then what follows in verse 18 to the end of the chapter is a, is a wonderful vision of the kingdom. So there'll be no more weeping, verse 19 says. Lifespans in the kingdom will be greatly increased, verse 20 says that... Uh, a person who dies when they're a hundred years old will still be considered to be a child. They'll build houses, verse 21, and inhabit them. Down to verse 25, talks about the wolf and the lamb feeding together and the lion eating straw like the ox. And the chapter closes, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. So this is the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, for which we look. But if we just read verse 18, we shall see that the Spirit interprets for us exactly what the new heavens and the new earth is. Because it says, But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create, for behold, I create 
Jerusalem are rejoicing and her people are joy. So can you see we've got another parallelism here. So the new heavens of verse 17 is Jerusalem of verse 18. And the new earth in verse 17 is her people. Now when the prophet here talks about Jerusalem, he doesn't mean Jerusalem as it is now. He means Jerusalem as it will be in the kingdom when Jeremiah says they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord and the city of the great king. The capital city of the kingdom where the dominion, the rulership of Christ and the saints will be based. And Again, we shan't turn to this, but you may remember that the Apostle John saw a vision of this new holy city in Revelation chapter 21, when he said, I saw new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw, I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You see how John here is picking up the language of Isaiah 65. But he says that this new Jerusalem was actually a bride. It was prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Precisely because the, the city of Jerusalem in the future will be the center for the administration of the saints in glory. And it's from Jerusalem that the saints will rule with power over the nations. Well, let's, uh, let's expand our understanding now and just take a, a quick look at some other examples in Scripture uh, where heavens and earth are used in, in a symbolic way. Let's have a look at Joel's prophecy. This is a, a good example. Now, Joel really uh, is a... It's a Bible class series in itself, really, but very briefly, what we've, what we've got to understand when we look at Joel's prophecy is that it has three distinct sections. It's divided into three, and these three sections are historically consecutive. So, in effect, the prophecy of Joel is, is a little continuous historic prophecy. So... Chapter 1, verse 1, through to chapter 2, verse 27. This section has to do with events that were taking place in the days of Joel himself. Specifically, I believe, although we're not told this, but I think you can prove it, that it relates to the Assyrian invasion that took place in the days of Hezekiah, led by King Sennacherib. So that's section 1. Now, section 2 is a very small section, chapter 2, verse 28, down to chapter 2, verse 32. And this little section has to do with events that were to take place in the first century, specifically relating to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And we know this because, of course, the Apostle Peter quotes this uh, in his speech on the day of Pentecost, recorded for us in Acts chapter 2. So that's section 2. And then section 3 is basically chapter 3, verse 1 to the end. And this chapter relates to the latter days, to our days and beyond, specifically relating to, particularly to the Battle of Armageddon and ultimately the establishment of the kingdom. So that's how Joel is structured. Now the interesting thing is that in each of these three sections there is a reference to the shaking of Israel's political heavens and earth. And it's this theme, shaking of the heavens and the earth, that punctuates the prophecy. And it's this theme that actually draws the whole of the prophecy together. It runs through the prophecy like a little thread. So the first one is in Joel chapter 2 and verse 10, where Joel says that the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And this, we believe, refers 
to the activity of Sennacherib in the days of King Hezekiah, uh, uh, whose hands, Sennacherib, the kingdom of Judah, was virtually wiped out. The second one is in Joel chapter 2 and verse 30, where it says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And of course we know this is quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2 and therefore it has relevance to the first century and this relates to the impending judgments of AD 70 that were ultimately carried out by the Romans. And then the third reference is in Joel chapter 3 and verse 15. The sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So the heavens and the earth shaking relate to his people, to the children of Israel. And we believe that this actually refers to the future time of Jacob's trouble in the latter days when Gog and his armies will come down against the nation of Israel like a cloud to cover the land. So that's just a, an example from uh, one of the minor prophets. Let's, uh, let's have a look at a couple of psalms now. Can we have a look at Psalm 8? We all know Psalm 8. <clears throat> and we perhaps imagine in our mind's eye David, the shepherd, sitting on the hillside looking into the heavens and, and marvelling at God's creative power and his own insignificance. And, and this may well be one of the things that provoked David to pen this psalm, although of course in reality he was moved to do so by the power of the Spirit. But let's just read it carefully. What is Psalm 8 all about? Well, read verse 1. O oh, Lord our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Now the revised version, correctly I think, says, who has set thy glory upon the heavens. Another question, is this true now? Is verse 1 true now? O Lord our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Well, we've got to say no, it's not. God's name is not excellent in all the earth now. God's name is blasphemed every day in the earth. But the point is that God's name will be excellent in the earth, in the kingdom. Malachi tells us so. Malachi chapter 1 verse 11, For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. So, can you see that actually Psalm 8 is a kingdom psalm. It's all about the kingdom. So when David says, who has set thy glory upon the heavens, he's talking about the heavens in the kingdom, not the heavens now. Now, what is he saying there? Is he saying that God's glory is revealed to us by the literal heavenly bodies? That, that when we look up into heaven, we see the glory of God. Is that what he's saying? Well, I don't think so. Ask yourself another question. What is the glory of God? And of course the answer to that is in Exodus chapter 34, isn't it? When Moses said, 
I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And what did Moses see? The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. That is God's glory. And we learn nothing about that from looking up into the sky, do we? So what the psalmist is saying here is that in the age to come, in the kingdom, the heavens, that is the rulership of Christ and the saints, the heavens will manifest the glory of God to the world. And this here in Psalm 8 verse 1 is the doctrine of God manifestation. Remember what? Daniel said in Daniel chapter 12, he said, They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That is the heavens that we have here in Psalm 8. It's not really talking about the material universe. Just turn on a few pages to the psalm that we read together, Psalm 19. Because here we've got another, I think, very similar example. And we've just read about it, in, uh, sung about it in that hymn as well. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Now, again, Exodus 34. Remember what the glory of God really is. It's his character, his moral character. character, And the literal universe may well does give testimony, powerful testimony, to the fact that God exists and that he is a powerful God, but it is silent about God's mercy and his truth. And as we read on, we actually discover something unusual about this heavens. We discover that it has a voice. And not only so, it can speak. Verse 2, day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And there, in verse 4, we have the key to Psalm 19 because we know without any shadow of a doubt what the psalmist is speaking about there because that verse is quoted in the New Testament and is actually applied to the preaching of the gospel by the apostles. It's in Romans chapter 10 and verse 15 where the apostle Paul is talking about preaching. He says, how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, Psalm 19, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. And so the first century preachers who took the gospel with them, they were the heavens in their day, speaking of the, the glory of God to those that had ears to hear. Because they were, as Paul says in Ephesians, they were in the heavenlies in Christ. And as we read on in Psalm 19, you'll notice that the emphasis all the way through the psalm is, is not on the sun, moon and stars, it's on the word of God. Look at verse 7, he says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. 
The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And so the whole emphasis on Psalm 19 is on the word of God, the, the, the literal word of God that was in the first century preached by the work of the apostles. Well, let's take another example now from the New Testament. Shall we have a look at Colossians chapter 1? Um, Colossians chapter 1. And verse 16. Talking about Jesus, it says in verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And, you know, we get ourselves into all sorts of trouble and difficulty with this verse unless we appreciate that the Apostle Paul is not speaking about the literal universe. He's talking about the new heavens and the new earth for which we wait. In fact, the whole of the epistle to the Colossians is based upon the early chapters of Genesis. Is just a few examples on the screen. So Colossians is, is built around Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. But what Paul is doing is he's contrasting the literal creation of heavens and earth that we're told about in Genesis with the new creation in Christ Jesus. And that's the explanation to verse 16. Now, how do we know that? Well, Look at verse 20. He says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in heaven or things in earth. Now just think very carefully about what Paul says here. Because what he says is, that there are things in heaven and things in earth that need reconciling through the blood of Christ and therefore at one time were alienated from God. There were things in heaven that needed reconciling through the blood of Christ. Now that cannot be true in any literal sense, can it? There is nothing in the literal heavens that needs reconciling through the blood of Christ. Everything that needs reconciling is down here on the earth. So clearly the Apostle Paul here is using symbolic language and he's speaking of the saints in Christ who inhabit the heavenlies because of the redemptive power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And and in the grace of God, this is the position that we occupy in prospect, as Paul says in verse 13. He says, He who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So, just to finish then, this, this approach to the symbolism of heavens and earth, I believe helps us to understand the meaning of lots of scriptures that otherwise might seem a little bit difficult to understand. For example, it it might help us to understand why God, in the beginning, promised Abraham that he would have a heavenly seed and an earthly seed. Remember, he said to Abraham that he'd have a seed as numerous as the stars of the heaven, but also a seed as numerous as the sand on the seashore. 
So we've got this same idea of heavens and earth there in the promises made to Abraham. What about Psalm 50? We shan't turn to this, but verse 6 says, The heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Now think about that. How do the heavens declare God's righteousness? And the answer, of course, is in the same way that the heavens declare the glory of God in Psalm 19, and the firmament shows his handiwork. In fact, if we were to look at the previous verse, we would have the explanation, because verse 5 says, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So the saints, they are the heavens. How about this verse from Isaiah 45, verse 8? Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Think about it. The literal heavens can't pour down righteousness any more than the literal earth can, can bring forth salvation. But the new heavens and the new earth of the kingdom can. Just one final example. Let's have a look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, this is a, a passage that we sometimes struggle with. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says here in verse 2, he says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. And we say, well, what, what was this third heaven to which Paul was transported in this vision where he saw things that wasn't lawful to utter? Well, I would suggest it's probably this. The first heaven, well, that was the Mosaic constitution that came to an end in AD 70. The second heaven, well, that's the millennium. This is the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, for which we wait. So the third heaven, well, I would suggest that Paul is referring to the post-millennial age, concerning which the scriptures say nothing other than that God will be all in all. And that's why Paul says there in verse 4, that he heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Well, I hope you found that interesting. I, I find this a, a fascinating subject, and, and really what we've done tonight is just to scratch the surface. So we wait, brethren and sisters, in faith and patience for the coming of that great day when there will indeed be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness.